continuing our reflection of spiritual renewal, purifying our souls as now we're experiencing the grace of God through the sacramental confession, through asking our Lord's mercy and contemplating the consequences of sin. This brings us to our meditation now of the mercy of God, God's infinite mercy. We find this at the end of paragraph number 71 in the Spiritual Exercises. St. Ignatius concludes that paragraph by saying, I shall also thank him for this, that up to this very moment he has shown himself so loving and merciful to me. And that's very important. I'm going to make a whole meditation just out of that one phrase of St. Ignatius. We can't end this whole chapter, this whole stage, the first stage about sin on a negative note. We have to be completely open up to the truth about Christ's forgiveness and His mercy. And so we do ourselves a great injustice if we just meditate on a negative and meditate on uh, woe. So therefore, let us delve into sacred scriptures into the very heart of God to experience this. But let us all the while keep praying for that deep hatred for sin. So we're constantly begging our Lord for an abiding hatred towards sin. And because of His mercy, we can even hate sin even more because we would never want to offend His goodness and His love that He has so mercifully shown to us and create abundance and and. And constantly. So, this is from Sacred Scriptures, the Book of Numbers, chapter 14, verses 30 to 31. This is the Word of God. Shall not enter into the land over which I lifted up my hand to make you dwell therein, except Caleb and the son of Jephoni, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your children of whom you said that they should be a prey to the enemies will I bring in, that they may see the law, the land which you have despised. And so it's this allowing Caleb and Joshua to enter in, into the land. And so here we are being invited by our Lord God into the land which many others are shut out of. And our Lord is allowing us to come. We're putting ourselves in the place of Caleb and Joshua. In Psalm 105, verses 23 to 25, And He said that He would destroy them had not Moses chosen, his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. And then of course, Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 8, for charity covereth a multitude of sins. And of course, how can we forget uh, St. Paul's phrase to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 20, and where sin abounded, Grace did more abound. Just think of that for a moment. The more sins they are, the graver they are, the uglier they are, the unutterable they are, the worse they are, the more the grace will abound. We're guaranteed that God's grace will ample and surpass any evil, any darkness. So therefore, there is never a reason for despair. The only way we can know that God will not forgive our sins is if we've committed a sin against the Holy Ghost, uh, which there in the, in the Gospels explains in St. Saint, Saint Augustine commenting about it, what is this? Sin against the Holy Ghost is just persevering in a mortal sin until death without, without repenting, uh, closing ourselves 
to, to the Holy Ghost. And the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 13. And rinse your hearts and not your garments. And turn to the Lord, for He is gracious and merciful, patient and rich in mercy and ready to repent of the evil. And from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 3, verses 12 to verse 14. O rebellious Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not turn away my face from you, for I am holy, saith the Lord, and I will not be angry forever. Return, O ye revolting children, saith the Lord. And Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 55, verse 6 to 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unjust man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he is bountiful to forgive. You know, just, you know if you try to stack up your, st your statistics, you know, Oh, I have all these black points and God's going to frown on me and so forth. So chuck them all out the window. <laughs> God, God is so much greater than all of that type of thing. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unjust man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he is bountiful to forgive. And the prophet Isaiah again in chapter 1 verse 18. If your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And if they be red as red crimson, they shall be white as wool. And then Peter came up to the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 22. Saying unto him, Lord, how often shall my brother offend against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus kind of chuckled there. <laughs> and he said, um, I say not to these till seven times, but till seventy times, seven times. So our Lord is being extremely exuberant in his forgiving Always ready to forgive. And then how is this one for scriptures? We're going we're gonna to put one thought on this one, on this, this last par parable. And then we're going to meditate on a prodigal son. So this first one from Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. Listen to this very attentively and prayerfully. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a king who would take who would take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to take the account, one was brought to him that owed him ten thousand talents. And as he had not wherewith to pay it, his Lord commanded that he should be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment be made. But that servant falling down besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant, being moved with pity, let him go and forgave him the debt. But when that servant was gone out, he found one of his fellow servants that, uh, that owed him a hundred pence, and laying hold of him, throttled him, and saying, Pay what thou owest. And his fellow servant falling down besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison until he paid the debt. Now his fellow servants, seeing what was done, were very much grieved. And they came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord called to him and said to him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt 
because thou besoughtest me, shouldst not thou then have had compassion also on thy fellow servant? And even as I had compassion on thee, and his Lord, being angry, delivered him to, to the torturers until he paid all the debt. And so also shall my heavenly Father do to you, if you forgive not everyone his brother from their, from your hearts. So this is an extraordinary story of the Holy Gospel. Could you imagine this man? Uh, he had a big family. He had his wife. And he had his 12 children. And, you know, he was responsible for that family. And he decided to go to Las Vegas to play around. You know, he wanted, he wanted to go over and he wanted to do the slot machine, you know, having everything. And he was being so lazy, and all his children began to become malnutrition. malnutrition. They, his wife was like uh, on ends. Uh, she was completely nervous. She was um, trying to provide for the children. Her her husband was out and all these all these uh, trips out having fun. I mean, just an extremely negligent man. And then um, and then some of his kids actually uh, got very sick. They were very very poor. Because he was out there, just throwing the money into the into the uh, the fireplace, you know, just throwing all the money, not even caring. Ha ha! Who cares about my little children over there? <laughs> and then, and then, could you imagine all of this? And then, the guy in charge of the town, so he's the magistrate of the town. He's the guy in charge of the prison, in charge of the city. He's like the mayor, let's put it that way. And so he's looking at his books, you know, and um, and he's saying, this man owes me money. And what's he doing with it, you know? And because he had to go pay some of the hospitals in the town, because everybody had to pay their little dues. And with this money, people can be uh, prolonged in life. They can have a little bit more oxygen tank. You know, they can have a little bit more <laughs> this, that, and the other. And believe me, the, for people to be able to live, not to be killed, not to be, uh, we, well, we can't help you. We have no money because uh, uh, Mr. Smith decided not to be lazy. And so he doesn't pay the tax, so you must die. <laughs> you know, all these widows and orphans and all these people of the town. So can you imagine, this is like the obvious thing. It's like one of these four sins that cry out for vengeance, immediate vengeance from heaven. And all it took was just for this good-for-nothing to get on his horse and go down before the magistrate and he threw himself before the magistrate <laughs> and, and he says please forgive me and I will pay you back all the debt in due time and the magistrate who has a, a very serious responsibility he has, to, he has to pay the medical bills of these widows and, and it's not just a, a an American 21st century widow like today, because these women are like they're like bosses. They're like they can go, go run companies and CEOs and stuff. They could be CEOs. Back in the ancient world, if you were a widow, you were like next to dead. Let's just put it that way. You, you had no rights. You had no sort of input into the society. You were good for nothing without your husband or your uncle taking care of you, or your brother or whatever. You were nobody. You were just as good as dead. And so the magistrate's like, well, we, we got we to gotta take care of these things here. And so he's like throwing himself out like a, like a theater, you know. Oh, please forgive me. Have patience with me. And I will pay you in full. And, uh, you know, and all these crocodile tears 
And but you know, you know what Jesus reveals here? That the magistrate forgave him. <laughs> he like fell into the trick. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. All it takes is just imperfect contrition. And of course, we know with the sacrament of confession, but it, it could be imperfect. I'm just afraid of the fires of hell. You know, I don't have all this high fluting uh, third heavens uh, type faith uh, to know that I'm offending on such a lovely, heavenly, heavenly heart of a father. Now, hopefully, I'll get there. But I mean, I'm not, I don't have all the the no wits and the how wits. It's just one of the most incredible things of all the sacred scriptures. What a disgrace of a man. Disgraceful. He's putting his wife, she's like completely depressed. She's like probably lost her whole, um, her whole sanity. Just because he's, he's uh, f- uh, as we say in, in Louisiana, fouilleing, you know, messing around with, uh, with levers over in Las Vegas. <laughs> And his wife is gone like she's like in a nervous breakdown. She's like in a padded room with 12 children trying to feed her children, you know. And he's just having fun, fun, fun. And then the whole town is in a complete uproar uh, because the orphans are dying of starvation and the, and the widows are dying because they have no income, nothing to help them. Okay, all right, so let us our imagine our imagination has already exhausted itself, right? And then look at that phrase of sacred scriptures. Can you imagine in that circumstance? And, and the Lord of that servant being moved with pity <laughs> let him go and forgave him the debt. And who knows, he might be in Las Vegas again. I, mean, I don't know. But at least on God's part, the, the magistrate's part, there is a complete and total forgiveness of the debt. You know, do a little, one little indulgence there, preliminary indulgence, you know. And voila, all the debt is paid for. And then it took, it took hypocrisy uh, to change the fate, you know. <laughs> so, so as soon as he opens up the door for the matter, thank you so much, my lord. And he opens up the door, and then closes. And as soon as that the door clicks, click, it's closed, and he turns around, and there is his little, uh, his little friend, you know, Spanky. <laughs> And he says, hey, what are you doing here? Come here to me. You, you owe me 10 cents. <laughs> oh, I, I can't. I have no way to pay it. And he's like, like just barely close the door from just talking to the, the mayor. <laughs> and, and he's grabbing this guy. Give me my 10 cents back. Give me, give me, give me. No, no. Absolutely. Please give me a few weeks. I'll be able to, to, to sweep a couple of floors. And I will give you... The ten cents, I want it now. And he starts giving him a headlock, and he starts choking him, you know. And he puts him into a closet and closes the door and keeps him there for two days, you know. And then, then all the rest of the servants looks at this and they say, "What? This guy? We just heard his conversation with the magistrate, and now, like five seconds later, he literally he's changing into this, you know." And then there'll be great punishments <laughs> that will happen to that type of attitude. And that's why we should be forgiving our brothers. You know? And one thing about forgiveness to our brothers and sisters, people who may, we may hold grudges with or resentments, it's important that it be an act of the will, not so much an act of the feelings. You know, so many times... We might not even, we might not even be able to share space with any in some particular individuals for the rest of our lives, you know. Um, if they have done such great damage to us, we're not expected to 
um, to embrace them and tell them, oh, I love you, my lubby-dubby. You know, we have not been commanded to do that. Uh, all it is is just a question of uh, from the will. Uh, in our prayer, we go before our Lord Jesus and we say, this person who has done me such great harm, such damage, uh, I forgive him. I want to forgive him. Help me to forgive. I don't know how to feel forgiveness, but here it is. I forgive. And that's it. As simple as that. That's forgiveness. That's an act of the will. You don't. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter how much time you want to be invested in that type of... That, all that stuff is doesn't matter. And if you do that every day, every time you do that, you put a, a layer of of salve over your heart, a balm, a healing balm. Every time you, every time you do it, doesn't matter what you feel. You can actually feel absolute repugnance towards somebody. It doesn't matter what you feel; it's what you will. And Lord, I forgive this person. I, you know, and then you do. Of course, we make efforts to. Uh, control the the raging anger within us we control our feelings you know we but it's not not that we're going to create our feelings or act like we can suppress them completely out uh, we don't we might not have the capacity for that and that's okay so there's a lot to meditate there just but instead of meditating on that second part of that um, gospel uh, we we don't want to Think about how the magistrate grabs him again and throws him in a prison and starts torturing him until he pays. We want to we want to meditate on the first part. How willing that that magistrate was willing uh, to forgive with so much injustice that was raging just previously, and how willing he was able to, he actually experienced pity for the man and let him go free. That's an extraordinary grace. And it it is what happens in confession. It is what happens within Christianity. And Christ our Lord himself reveals this reality. Now taking this a little further, let us um, let us meditate on a prodigal son. So Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Let us see this gospel passage as if it was the first time that our Lord Jesus was telling it to us. He's telling it to us. Imagine yourself like a fly on a wall, listening to the conversation, listening to the preaching. And Jesus has you in mind as he's telling the story. Let us look at the son, the um, the son of the father. It is undeniable that this son is a, a disgraceful, um, good for nothing. Uh, Jesus chooses the adjectives, and he's choosing the storyline to to scandalize the ears that are listening to him at the time. Because as you know, back in the times of Jesus and, and the whole ancient Hebrew culture, uh, the father figure was the most important thing. It's a patriarchal society, period. It is all based on the, on the image of the father. And, and, and anything that goes up against that is considered absolutely satanic, absolutely like as if it's the worst sin that you can possibly ever commit is to go up against the honor of the Father, to go up against anything that has to do um, with one's own Father. Um, and the Hebrews, the Israelites, had that extremely understood. And so when Jesus was telling them about this young man who takes the entire inheritance i mean it's almost like it's almost like going into the 1960s and 70s you know this sort of a, this hippie uh revolution that just shocks everybody around except for the hippies you know 
And it's like this, this thing with like people like rubbing their eyes saying, could this be, you know, it's like the most off the wall things that you can possibly imagine. I mean, something like this would merit almost the death penalty for sure. I mean, people like listening to his story, like saying, this guy did what? You know, it's the most embarrassing. And not only is it most embarrassing for the son to be behaving in such an off the off the wall manner but it's actually embarrassing for the father because it shows the lack of manliness of the father that, that every man was protecting back in those cultures you know they would protect their own honor their their family would never be able to behave in such a way because that reflected on him personally and so so there was a reckoning with the father for sure back in those days. And it was just, it was also decreed by the law of Moses. It, it was expected of, 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 of holy religion. It was expected of, uh, of, of, of the people of Israel. And so the father will fight for his honor. I mean, could you imagine him... Uh, this is all he has. You know, these, these were pre-materialistic societies back then. They, they had more emphasis on family life. They had more emphasis on, on society, on honor, uh, on these things. And so his father, could you imagine? A, a son uh, faking, lying to his father. And, and not just the honor of the father, but taking all of his hard work, the earnings of all his hard work. The hard work. I mean, I mean, today we can get money just by investing in something and just sitting back and pop, propping our feet on the table, you know. <laughs> and then, then there we are. Uh, we're we're uh, gaining money, you know. But back then, you know, you had to work with your hands. You had to sweat. You had to. And all of a sudden, the sun like grabs like a third or more of all of his all of his wealth. All of his inheritance, hard work. And what does he do? He doesn't go and um, and invest in some sort of a retirement plan for his father. <laughs> you know, he doesn't go and you know, kind of like you know, to continue on the family name within honor. He goes and he does everything against the holy religion of his father. Everything that is the most despicable. And worthy of death, going off into a foreign pagan land, and goes and commits the all the sins against the sixth and ninth commandment, and all the other commandments. He's stealing, he's robbing, he's uh, um, he's lying, and he's committing adultery. He's going out, he's doing all these things. But with the honorable treasures of the father. <laughs> and this is what really breaks the father's back. It like what really puts him into a tremendous sorrow. Um, so it's like taking the face of the, of the father and just smearing it in the mud. You know, just, just grabbing his, his hair and pulling him down and just washboarding him into the cement. You know, sanding his face into the mud, into the cement ground, the floor. Wow, I don't know about you, but I, I almost like, wow, I wouldn't want to be the sun. <laughs> what, I mean, and, and everybody knows, it, everybody sees it. You know, everybody sees it. The story's out. The scandal has been raging around in the, in the countryside, in the, the whole town, the whole land. And the son just goes off, you know, and he just goes, just puts himself full headlong into the 1960s hippie revolution and of the worst kinds, you know, put everything you want there, drugs, everything. Uh, and not just for like a, like a week, you know, a week in Vegas, but like... Uh, months and months of just spending thousands of dollars every day on just the worst were the father's inheritance. 
and um, and then it took a famine, <laughs> so the famine hit, and then that land was being brutally tested. Um, and the son lost all his money. He spent the, every last dime of the inheritance that he had. And then all the women just started walking away like, wow, you don't have any money anymore. <laughs> and then they all walk away and, and then there's no more, no more uh, Walmart to go buy some groceries. And then it does like, like, where do I get food at? You know, and he's like, he's way off. He's like light years away from civilization. And he's like sitting there saying, oh my goodness, I, I'm a little hungry right now. You know, um, what should I do? <laughs> and so he ends up going to a farm and he goes and he does, he does, he's still resisting the father, still with the last punches into the father's face. Yeah. He goes up, he knocks on the door. Yes. Do you not see, son, that we're in a depression in the land? Yes, but please, could I just share the food with the pigs? Do whatever you want. Who cares about you? <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, goody. So I go. So could you imagine? I mean, if you say the word pigs. <laughs> In a Hebrew village back in those days, everybody will cringe like, what did he do? You know? Like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, we don't have any concept of this. We don't, we don't know what this means. You know? But these ears, those that were hearing it, knew it. And it was the last, the final smash in the face of the father. My son is now living among pigs and he's walloping in them. You know, to this day, even to the 21st century, the Jews do not even eat bacon, you know. They refuse to eat pig. Could you imagine back in those days? Pig was just absolutely a, a, a dirty animal uh, and, and religiously a dirty thing. That no one could ever even dream of enjoying or much less living with. So he's, he's living like a pig, brushing up with them, eating the husks in the mud. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that you cannot get lower than this. There's no sins that could be committed that can ever match with Jesus uh, stimulated in the eardrums of these hearers uh, during this parable. The father is utterly offended in every possible way, even without with the father not even knowing half what he's been doing. The father is just completely victimized here by the son. And then the son says, I'm really tired of these husks. You know, I, I can't take this anymore. You know, um, He's like a zombie, totally gutted of any meaning, any purpose. He might as well not have been circumcised you know, among the people of Israel. He's worse than a pagan, worse than a pig, worse than pork. If that can never be worse. And so then he starts to have a, a slight thought. He says, what happens if I go back home and share the doghouse with, with my pet? You know, I could just be there and just eat from his bowl. And at least I can be sheltered a bit. I can be... So he's toying along with this idea. And all of this not because of what he did to his father, but because of his, his, the stomach that had so much hunger, out of pure fear for himself. And this was the start that the father was going to call him back. You know, 
Now, at this point in the story, everybody is saying, oh, the son is going to go back home. Ooh, let's watch that, that, that belt start smashing around. <laughs> you know, let's watch that belt. Man, this, this kid's going to get it. You know, everybody's like, wow, let's see what happens when he gets back home. And, but Jesus takes a completely shocking turn, a scandalous uh, turn of events while explaining the story. Remember Jesus, he says in the Holy Gospel, uh, blessed are those who are not scandalized by me. And he's saying some real scandalous things to these people. Uh, it's impossible. Could God ever forgive this son? No way. This kid's going to rot in hell forever. And Jesus is giving us the impression that the father is at the window every day and he's not imagining wrath and actions of vengeance upon his son but rather thoughts like will my son ever come back I love my son he was staring at those baby pictures looking at that cute little goober you know that, that little Gerber goober <laughs> <laughs> and he's just remembering the beauty of his son. Oh, could I, my son ever come back? I love my son. I would do anything for him. And believe me, this is a real scandal. There's no imagining of, of punishments. I mean, the son is experiencing his punishment right there, but the father has so many other plans than just punishing his son. He wants him to come back. And he wants to reunite with his son so desperately. You know, the story they had back in Vietnam, during, during the Vietnam War, they had a, a an article once came out in the, his, a father had a son go off to war, in the Vietnam War. And the story goes in the article that the father would pace there in New York City, in Long Island, in his apartment, every day, pace every day by the window, seeing, seeing if his son's ever going to come back. Day after day after day, wondering if he was going to come back. Until finally he did not come back, ever. But that image of that father pacing the floor, you know, my son, worrying for his son, worrying about his well-being. And not just his spiritual well-being, his physical well-being, his psychological well-being, his integral good of his son. Incredible, an incredible grace. And this, my dear brothers, is the Heavenly Father. No one knows the depths of the love of the Father for a son. For every individual soul, God the Father loves that soul infinitely. And God the Father will never give up on a soul. And that's why, please God, there will be many zealous and holy priests that will be those messengers of this love of the Father. Because the Father can't leave the property. The Father has to stay there on the property. He's not going to go run off to these distant lands. Because, in other words, the property symbolizes divine charity. And he's not going to leave that so uh, casually. He's not going to lower himself into these atmospheres. He loves his son so much, but he's waiting for the son to come back. Waiting. 
And if we use human terms, hoping, hoping that his son will make the move. And then came the day. <laughs> After perhaps years, I mean, we don't, we don't know the exact details of this, but after a long time, all of a sudden, the sun started walking up the long, long driveway. And the father looks from above. And he's looking out the window. Could that be him? That is him. And he runs, you know, with his old age, you know, throws his little staff aside. And he, he runs down the stairs, missing about three steps at a time, you know, running down like, as if he was a youth and, and his high school track team, you know. And he runs out there and he bangs the door and everybody, all the slaves are like, whoa, what's going on? Son, son, running and huffing and puffing. Son, he has to stop a second. Okay, let me get my breath. You know. And he goes, runs again. And the son is like, oh, here we go. I have to make this little speech, you know. Got to go to confession. <laughs> you know. And then the, the father comes. And the father comes, son. And the son starts his little spiel. Forgive me, father. If I have sinned against thee in heaven, I am unworthy to be called thy son. Don't say anything. My son, you're back. And there was a great embrace. Unlike anyone can ever describe in human language, the heart of the father he found his son. His son is back. He's standing on his turf. Yes, there'll be so much to fix. So much to deal with, so much to try to digest and understand and reintegrate him, but the sun is back. That's what matters. Who cares with everything else? Believe me. There's the father. All the suspicions of, of the other siblings and the other the other workmen's and the other slaves that were saying, what's going on here? Why is he back? And what is it? We heard so much. But between the son and the father, and only in the father's only little world, there was so much else going on. Total and unbridled forgiveness. And love pouring his love into that son's heart. It's absolutely extraordinary. And it didn't even matter if his son at that second was Stalin or Hitler or Mao, Sitong. It was a son that was back in the turf. Quick, bring him and put rings upon his fingers and put garments upon him and kill the fatted calf for we must celebrate today for this son of mine was dead and now he is alive. He's alive. My dear brothers, if we only experience the mercy of God, if we only allow that mercy to come into us, it's extraordinary. Why do we doubt this mercy of God? Jesus revealed it to us fully, unbridledly. Don't worry about your career, what's going to happen, how people will think of me, and how the other thing. The only thing is that we're pleasing the Heavenly Father. That's all. We belong to Him. We are, we're His sons. We don't belong to anyone else. It only matters what God thinks. The Father, all He had to do is just see Him back in His presence. 
on his turf. So I would invite you to meditate on this very detailedly, on this mercy of God. Let God's mercy come to you. Don't, don't hold back and believe that it's there. God, and you know, even, even in the future, uh, when we establish in God's mercy, even when we go to our weekly confession, you know, that we go every single week, and even, albeit, even if we're just confessing venial sins, know this, we're receiving a sacrament. That means that we're going into that very heart of the Father, at this Father right here. And He experiences all of this over and over again. This joy, this, this indescribable return to the Father and the Son. The Heavenly Father is, is, is shedding all of His mercy, you know. And that's why, especially if we're just confessing venial sins every week, you know, which is a good thing. The Council of Trent tells us uh, to confess our venial sins. You know, and that's why toward the end of our confessions, we should just always mention to the confessor, you know, Father, forgive me for these and all my sins, especially for my past, especially against the, you know, ninth commandment or whatever. Uh, just re remind, be a reminder of the evil that we have done in the past, even if it's just naming it by one sentence, you know. And all of that, all of that mercy of the Father is renewed, that joy. Didn't Jesus our Lord say that there's more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than 99 righteous of no need of no need of forgiveness? How the angels rejoice and all the saints rejoice over that one sinner coming back. And believe me, and I put myself in first place, I am that sinner. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.